What does it take to be a human being? Have you ever thought about that question? We, are, we live our lives as if to be human is like being a window where you install your window and then it's just there. And if someone says, you know, how's the window? You look at the window, you see through the window, it seems sound, the glass seems fine. You say the window is fine. The window is a thing. And when you treat something like a thing, you don't treat it as if it's in a dynamic process of development. And you certainly don't treat it as if it requires care and that it might make decisions. Whereas if you say, you know, how is your cat doing and you're not at home, when you're asking that about your pet sitter saying, hey, how's the cat doing? I have a little Turkish Angora cat. Then they have to check. They have to check because you're not asking about a thing. You're asking about life. You're asking about a living individual. And a living individual is not a thing. It is a living process. It's an individual reality. And the individual reality is something dynamic and something that changes through time. So Kierkegaard's view of the human being, I've been discussing in this public introduction to him, is the most radically humanistic view of the human being in the 19th century. I began this lecture series by talking about Kierkegaard as a radical humanist, um, which is not a category that's unique to me. It's a category other Kierkegaard scholars recognize as well. And in this final episode of the free series, in the, in a way, beginning of what is the second sequence of the 12-part audio course that I'll be releasing today, as you watch this, you can go check it out and um, purchase it at my website. So please do that. If you've enjoyed this, you'll really enjoy that as well. I want to discuss what it means to be a human being under the category that is Kierkegaard's central idea, as he himself says, and that is the single individual. And to understand the significance of the single individual, we need to understand something about our own time that I've been gesturing at um, in this series that I discuss at length in Becoming Human Origins, the beginning of my public work, first released in podcast form. You can listen to the first episodes of it still for free, and you can buy the whole series now. This reality of what our age is like is what Kierkegaard was concerned with. Kierkegaard saw our age as one of disintegration. Kierkegaard said in one of his late works, collected in the point of view of my work as an author, that we live in the age of disintegration. And one of the great myths of modernity is that it is individualistic. And this is something that you hear um, as a critique of modernity by usually very conservative or extreme left-wing um, statist doctrines. There's always a critique of modernity is too individualistic. If you look at this movement today called post-liberalism, which is really a form of anti-liberalism that is often extremely indistinguishable from what we would historically call authoritarian or fascistically tending forms of government, the post-liberals, like in Patrick Deneen's influential book with Yale um, about liberalism, why liberalism failed, Deneen critiques liberalism's fundamental problem as being that of individualism. And this is a very common canard, particularly of people on the right, and there's few people who can be as right-wing as uh, conservative, ethnically white, dominant culture Catholics. Um, and, and I'm not against Catholics at all. I'm just saying historically the Catholic Church has been an extremely strong supporter of authoritarian governments. Um, and that's a historical fact. And, and some of the most influential theorists of authoritarian governments who are very famous today, like Carl Schmitt, are extremely influential in the post-liberal circles um, because there's a real commonality of spirit there. And they hate the individualism of the modern world. They hate the idea that individuals have rights and freedoms that can subvert traditional institutional structures like the family or the state or the Roman Catholic Church. And this is, in, in a way, a very defensible position. If you read Deneen's book, it's essentially a complaint about all of the things almost everyone who's a broadly progressive elite would agree are problems in our society some of which also, you know, relate well to conservatives. But there's broad overlap that we have a lot of things wrong in the world. 
And Deneen's is one of a long series of books that essentially just take the fact that the world has problems, which is um, self-evident because humans are what make up the world, that humans experience and humans are corrupt and evil beings. We're good and evil. So the evil part of us makes the world a really horrific place. The good part of us makes us want to try to make it better. Um, but there's this kind of complaint that basically blames the fact that we're evil on some specific historical phenomenon. And this is always a form of cultural polemic. And cultural polemic is very dangerous if the polemic isn't well motivated, Is it if it isn't based on a profound understanding. And I don't think, for example, the right-wing critiques of modernity tend to have an accurate understanding of what characterizes modernity. And you could say, well, isn't individualism a characteristic of modernity? Isn't it the case that it's only in the modern world that you get the assertion of the rights of the individual, that you get the assertions of the rights of people to be unique? And the answer is yes and no. If you look at the French case, which is a classic example of the radical movement that transformed human nature and civilization called the Enlightenment, the Aufklärung in German, um, where it has a slightly more often conservative but also more radical form. Its most famous form, of course, comes to expression in the French Revolution. And there's a huge influence of the thought of the Enlightenment philosophers, and particularly, and this is very complicated, because he's a kind of also critical of the Enlightenment philosopher, Jean-Jacques Rousseau. But if you look at the French doctrine of human rights, it's not protective of individual rights. Um, the French state is a genuinely, you could say, a liberal, radical form of uh, Republican freedom in what it espouses. But of course, we know that the freedoms that the French Republic espoused in its first form did not protect the aristocracy under the rule of law from being essentially lynched in the sense of a communal execution as a sort of form of communal governance, which violates the rule of law, but gives voice to genuine public sentiment. So it didn't stop the violation of the rights of the aristocracy. And to this day, France has a very profound and interesting and um, noble but complex relationship to individual expression. As you may know, there's a, there was a huge controversy about um, the fact that in French culture, there's a doctrine in France called laïcité, which we translate as secularization or the secular secularity of the state. And according to the French understanding of laïcité, which is linked to what it means to be a good French person and therefore a good Republican and a defender of universal human rights, individual forms of religious expression were banned if they were of a certain form of noticeability in French public schools, like, for example, a headscarf that Jewish women wear and particularly Muslim women might be wearing in the context of the French communities the immigrant and migrant communities that are part of the French public school system, particularly from France's former colonies. And this caused a huge um, controversy. And from the United States perspective, which has a different tradition of individual rights and freedoms, it looks like a, a repression of the individual freedom to religious expression. To the French perspective, it's a protection of the French conception of human rights. But the French conception of human rights, you could say, arguably tends to favor a universal category of the human, which gets closely annexed to the French idea of the state and the French idea of French society. And this is a completely respectable view, which has benefits and it has downsides, just as the American view has benefits and downsides. My point is the French view is not actually obviously individualistic. And part of that has to do arguably with the long influence of Catholic thought on France, Whereas the form of political religious freedom that comes to expression in America is much more influenced by Protestantism. And that one of the famous Catholic critiques of Protestantism is its individualism. And I'm, I'm writing a long essay about post-liberalism currently, and this is something I discuss in length of this essay I'm working on, that the Catholic critique of Protestantism is really what underlies the post-liberal critique of liberalism. Liberalism is really just a proxy term for Protestant Christianity. And Kierkegaard is about as Protestant as uh, you can come in the sense that he is a radical affirmer of the importance of the single individual. And so the question of what the single individual means, I hope, is becoming more potent because modernity is not in any obvious sense about the individual. Modernity has 
the most extraordinary success in coercing, suppressing, and propagandizing people into forms of mass conformity of any society um, in recorded history, even authoritarian societies, which I'm not saying are better, but even authoritarian societies in different technological conditions did not have the same capacity to act on the beliefs and behaviors and values and emotions of their populations that modern societies do, which have very, very strong doctrines of the state, and they have the technological and bureaucratic apparatus to impose the will of the state in the name of the freedom of the individual on people. So liberalism or individualism is a very complicated thing that there's often a very dishonest failure to reckon with that complexity. Um, it's often treated as a very simple thing that you can understand under sort of slogans like individualism, which is not a very useful term unless you give a very clear sense to it. Now, individualism in the sense of the priority of a human person over, say, a group is one of the most basic senses of individualism. And it is true that modernity in that sense sees the rise of the assertion of individual rights. And we see this particularly in the Romantic movement. But here's the thing. Individualism as a term is just a term. Most of the idea of individualism is a form of mass conformism. So, for example, think about the fact that the reason that most of us want to be individuals is because we're taught that we should. So in other words, we're indoctrinated to believe that somehow we should seem very unique. And this idea of uniqueness leads to a complete conformity to whatever our commercial consumer capitalist culture and our elite class that presents the media images of what an ideal person and what an ideal look like. They're the ones who set the norm that all the other classes of society essentially seek to conform to by adopting or by reacting against. So the pursuit of individualism becomes a pursuit of mass conformity. And this is something that critics of individualism would recognize, and they would blame it on individualism itself, which is very paradoxical. The idea is that if somehow individualism leads to mass conformity, it's a problem of individualism, rather than maybe the word individualism is a very poor description for any doctrine or way of being human that leads to mass conformity. Kierkegaard is the greatest protector, the most zealous protector of the right of the human individual to come to know its true depths. And depth is what Kierkegaard fundamentally offers, and depth is what Kierkegaard is fundamentally connecting to the single individual. And depth is what Kierkegaard is fundamentally attacking the absence of in what he calls the system and modernity. So paradoxically, the reason we live in an age of disintegration is because the tendency of modern culture since the Enlightenment has been to assume that you can use science in this very broad, dangerously undefined sense. You can use science to impose the best way of being human on human populations through the government um, or through a philosophical system or through an economic political system like in Marxism. And we have seen that it is in the period of so-called hyper-individualism of modernity that you get doctrines like Marxism, which produce the greatest form of mass totalitarian conformity that we see as a unique expression of a philosophical doctrine. Arguably, you could say, for example, fascism also encourages a huge amount of conformism, but it's also usually connected more to traditional cultural or ethnic traditions of the fascistic society, like Italian culture um, or German culture in the case of the Third Reich. So there's, of course, a kind of conformism, but that's because the human tendency is to recognize that being an individual is difficult. You're not an individual, Kierkegaard thinks, as we saw, because you look different from other people. That's the way the aesthetic person thinks. But the aesthetic person isn't wrong in the sense that they want to feel distinct. We want to feel that we matter in the world. And here's a, here's a radical idea that I want you to think about, because Kierkegaard brings this up over and over again in different ways. Do you think that your state, the state that you live in, would sacrifice an enormous amount of its energy in order to protect your 
individual life. Your individual life. Now, if you're privileged enough to live in a society where you feel that that's true, that is a wonderful grace. I'm not sure that any of us do live in such a society, um, but certainly we could recognize some states to be more caring about us as individuals than others. So other states actively disregard individuality. But think about that. Do you really think your state would make an enormous sacrifice if everyone else was fine in order to save you, to protect you? And when you think about utilitarianism, it's the most anti-utilitarian idea. The idea that people should be protected in their individuality, that it would be somehow worth sacrificing for one single life. Kierkegaard's idea of what the human being is, what you are, is that you are a unique, completely unprecedented reality that exists in forms that have commonalities with every other form of reality, every other form of our species, of course he recognizes that. Kierkegaard famously says in the Antiklimaku pseudonym that the human being is a synthesis of the finite and the infinite, of the temporal and the eternal, and of the necessary and the free. And the conformist aspect of human nature always identifies the human being with their historical, finite, conditioned or necessary dimension and uses that as an excuse. It uses human nature as an excuse to impose violently on the will of the individual, even if that individual is simply in deviation from the norm, but is not harming anyone. But from the standpoint of the group, from the standpoint of group identity, from the standpoint of orthodoxy, which Kierkegaard is extremely critical of in a socially illogical sense or a social sense, the idea is you it's worth sacrificing individuals to protect the group. This is a very hard to argue with idea. We see it motivates human history. What is the whole group supposed to be destroyed simply to defend an individual? And when you put it like that, you have a kind of historical tension. But Kierkegaard recognizes, of course, like Hegel and others, that that tension is not static, it's dialectical. Socrates introduces into Greek society this very dilemma on Hegel's interpretation. Socrates essentially puts into question the unreflective values of the Athenian society. And when he's brought to trial, the majority of Athenians in their democracy vote to condemn Socrates and to impose the death penalty on him. So Socrates becomes a literal martyr for his individual mission. His defense of his life is a vocational defense. He says, I was called to do this. I was divinely mandated to practice philosophy, and therefore I cannot abandon my task. And he says, if you, if I'm released from this trial, I will go back immediately to practicing philosophy as the god, which is the god Apollo, the god of the Delphic Oracle, the most, in a way, the most important god to the Greek people. And the Delphic Oracle was certainly the most centrally important oracle for the people, as I discuss in episodes two, um, episode two and one, and part of three, I think, of Becoming Human Origins. So there is this incredible price that Socrates pays, but his individuality has literally irradiated 2,400 years of history. Socrates' commitment to his own individual vocation and mission has transformed history. And Socrates was the crucial single figure, along then with Jesus, for Kierkegaard. And for Kierkegaard, the great problem of his age was he saw that it was obvious as a 19th century European male that he lived in an age dominated by the values of Christianity. But he thought that Christianity in the form of Christendom, which is, you could say, the sort of cosmic institutional order that had been made over the centuries of European society, and the Christianization of the Roman Empire. Christendom, a type of world that doesn't require any particular individual commitment. There's churches, people go to churches, whatever they may or may not believe, it's part of what you do. He saw this as the greatest threat. He saw Christendom as the greatest threat to true Christianity or true individuality that existed. And he gives a hilarious anecdote in one of his texts 
where a Danish man, because remember, most churches throughout history have been state-sponsored churches. They've literally been funded by taxpayers who didn't have a choice but to give tithes to them through their taxes. And it was socially important often to be a respectable person that you had some connection with religion in a conservative um, society in which Christendom still ruled. Now, the Enlightenment was a challenge to Christendom, but it didn't totally disrupt it. The Enlightenment often would impose a new form of conformism, which might be more liberal, more tolerant in some ways, but still it created an orthodoxy. And wherever you get an orthodoxy, you get the equivalent of Christendom, which is a kind of institutional world of values and cultural institutions that come from something that no one's really that concerned with. In Christendom, it's not very cool or hip to be too concerned with Christianity, right? You may know the story of Van Gogh, if I remember it right, Van Gogh adopted a very radical lifestyle that looked very literally just like what aspects of the Bible command when he began doing his ministry work with a church. And because of this, uh, it was perceived as somehow being arrogant and he was fired, if I remember that anecdote correctly. Kierkegaard is not unlike uh, Van Gogh in this tradition, that there's a sort of radicality to Kierkegaard where he set himself against the institutional structure of the Danish church. And you could say, well, I'm not a Christian. I don't care about this. Well, first of all, again, as I've stressed in all of my work, it doesn't matter whether you personally believe in something, if that something has profoundly influenced you. You still need to understand it. So that's the first point. The second point is we all live in a society shaped by Christianity and more broadly shaped by the religions that come from Abraham that we call Judaism, Islam, and Christianity. They very much shape our world. And without a deep understanding of them, we can't be informed geopolitical individual social actors. We can't be educated if you don't understand the influence of what we call religion today. And Kierkegaard's mission was to restore Christianity to Christendom, which you could put in secular terms by saying his mission was to restore the individual truth as it had been lost in the group essence. To restore the individual truth as it had been lost in the group essence. Here's, for example, what he says in one of his really important works to understand his authorship um, related to um, the point of view this text is collected. It's called On My Work and the Single Individual. Kierkegaard says, The single individual is the category through which, in a religious sense, the age, the history, the age, history, the human race must go. And the one who stood at Thermopylae was not as so secure as I, who have stood, in order at least to bring about an awareness of it. At this narrow pass, the single individual. So why is the single individual so important? Well, we've seen, first of all, that the modern age is not in any obvious sense an age of individualism. There is a social sense in which, yes, group um, and institutional structures have been subverted by what's perceived as individual or non-group actors. But those actors aren't grasped as real individuals. A real individual is not just a category. It's not just a category. It's a category that defines something that you can't express because it's a unique person you have to get to know. Starting with yourself, you are a unique individual. You can't know yourself by looking at social media. You can't know yourself just by reading books. You couldn't know yourself if you read every book of science and learning and wisdom in the world. You could not know yourself just by reading books or by knowing what everyone else is like. You would never still know yourself. Now, you couldn't know yourself without knowing as much as you could about those things, but you would still not know yourself. So the idea of the single individual is the claim that I mentioned earlier in the last lecture that when you're willing to accept that your humanity is not a given condition like being a glass window or being a chair or being a table or being anything in the world, but it's rather a task. It's a task and a calling and a demand. Then you begin to recognize that you are summoned And that name of that summoning, when you begin to experience it, is existence. When you are aware that you as an individual are valuable. In fact, you are so valuable you would be, and Kierkegaard thinks we are, frightened of how valuable we are. 
So when I asked the question, do you think your state, the place that you live in, would go out of its way to sacrifice to protect you and only you as a single individual? Think about the fact that not Christianity as a religion, as a Christendom, as a group orthodoxy, but the teachings that underlie Christianity of the Jewish rabbi Jesus. Jesus was a Jewish rabbi, just like many rabbis, and some rabbis have thought they were the Messiah, and um, Jews have argued about those things that's been part of Jewish history. Jesus was a Jewish teacher and rabbi, and one of his stories famously was this. He says, you know, imagine there's a shepherd who has a hundred sheep and one of them gets lost. He says, won't the shepherd leave the 99 sheep who are safe and sound and go and spend his individual energy, leaving behind the ones who are safe to find the single lost sheep? And Jesus says that is what the true God is like. The true God will let the whole group be as it were and will sacrifice just to find the lost individual. Even if the individual got lost and it's sort of their fault, the shepherd's still going to go after the sheep because the shepherd's a good shepherd. The shepherd's doctrine and duty is to care for the sheep, not to judge the sheep. It obviously has to help them learn to behave safely and be good sheep. But the shepherd is there to take care of the sheep. And in the Platonic and Socratic tradition of philosophy, philosophy is the care of your soul. Your soul is, as it were, the one of these sort of sheep or flock of sheep that each of us is responsible to take care of. And it's extremely convenient to think that you will know how to do that just by conforming to your society, by doing what other people want you to do. And you can't just then see what they want you to do and say, well, I'm not going to do that. I'll rebel and then I'll be a real individual. That's just as dependent on what they want. Instead of doing it, you're running against it. But the reason you're running against it is because you're being defined by it. You can't change that dialectic and movement. You have to learn to transcend it by accepting it. We are conditioned by our environments. We are conditioned by how we're raised. We are conditioned by a desire for safety, which means a desire for conformity. That's a natural part of us, but it becomes corrupt. And it's extremely easy to lose yourself in the crowd. And you don't get to stand out of the crowd by putting on strange clothes or performing some fashionable way of being a new kind of human. Those things may be legitimate or illegitimate. I'm not judging them, but they don't make you an individual. They're aesthetic ways of performing the search for individuality, certainly the search for difference, but they don't really make you different. Why? Because what ultimately defines us is not something Here's a key, key word in Kierkegaard that is commensurable with external existence. It's not something that you can just see. In the aesthetic phase, the aesthetic thinks that all inwardness essentially has an outward expression. And therefore, in order to be genuinely inwardly different, you have to be externally at variance or against or moving somehow against the crowd or ethical norms of your society or your group. This is a very natural but wrong and dangerous idea and Hegel, therefore, thinks that what Kierkegaard would call the ethical, the particular asserting itself against the group, he thinks that's what sin is. So Hegel's doctrine of evil, if you know Hegel, is basically particular deviance from what is universal. And he has no other doctrine of evil or sin when it comes to humans than essentially that. And that is what Kierkegaard is polemicizing against in Fear and Trembling. When he talks about an absolute relationship to the absolute, that's about the individual. So here's the question. Is there anything beyond groups, whether it be the nation, the family, your historical location, affiliation, gender identity, whatever it may be. Is there anything beyond a type of group identity that actually has a claim on you that would transcend those claims? Now, I'm not saying they're necessarily in conflict, but that would be higher than them. And Kierkegaard is absolutely convinced that there is, and that's what makes each of us have a unique human dignity. Kierkegaard's belief is that what he calls Christianity really means is that the true God would leave all of, you could say, the divine perfection, right? Would leave all of the pleasures of being divine and would enter into a totally humiliating state of a completely hidden, concealed identity, an incognito identity that a king would become a beggar who would let himself be abused 
by people who are contemptuous, rich people, whoever, poor people who are still wealthier than the beggar. Basically, that's Kierkegaard's view, that the doctrine of true Christianity says that the God portrayed in the Bible um, would sacrifice all of the comforts of heaven, as it were, and enter into the humiliating condition of a fallen world just to find one single individual. And Kierkegaard believed that if he spoke to you as a single individual, he says, you can read his work, he says, I'm writing for you. I'm writing for you. He wants to awaken you to your extraordinary dignity and value. And the way we become awakened to that, which I think is so essential today, is through recognizing the necessity of depth. Depth can be fetishized, and I don't really like that. I'm not like, oh, he's so deep. But we have to understand that any world defined by conformism, like our world is, will be incredibly shallow. And there will be an enormous amount of conflict because all of what we think matters in the world will be these very shallow, visible forms of difference that we then argue and fight about. You know, Republicans and Democrats, you have these partisan divisions in American society and other societies. And there are differences between them, but the differences are all generally legible, at least to the people. They think they know what's wrong with their opponents. They think they know what's right with their opponents. This is shallow. Right? My greatest critique, for example, of a lot of philosophy today is not that the people doing it aren't smart. Right, I'm not some idiot who thinks I'm smarter than other people. It's rather that a lot of philosophy today isn't deep. It doesn't value depth. Philosophy is supposed to be about wisdom, and wisdom is difficult to attain. Um, and wisdom requires respect for tradition. It's not wise to disregard tradition, right? You know from my work, I'm, I'm, I am no slavish adherent of any tradition, but I respect tradition immensely. I respect the Chinese tradition, the Indian tradition. I'm very invested in trying to learn what societies have understood to be the wisdom that they still regard as essential to understanding themselves and to growing into human beings. Because how else could we grow except by looking at what humans have thought this has really helped humans? And then we have to learn to sift what is true in that. What does it mean? How do we understand it? So this idea of depth is part of Kierkegaard's radical critique of what he sees as the tendency even of the deepest philosophical systems of his age, particularly Hegel and the German ideals systems in general, he sees their a tendency to conflate reason and being reasonable with being systematic and to conflate being systematic with being totalizing. So Kierkegaard, as I'm going to discuss throughout the next course that I'll be teaching, the audio course that you can purchase today, Kierkegaard is, I would argue, the most systematic philosopher in the 19th century. He's far more systematic than Hegel is. And a Hegelian or someone who doesn't know Kierkegaard well would find this laughable, but it is, I am absolutely convinced it's the case. And, you know, there's great scholars who have written very effectively to show that it's the case, particularly in the Danish tradition. And the systematicity of Kierkegaard is itself the greatest critique of the idea of the system. For Kierkegaard, systematicity and coherence and consistency is not the same thing as the system. The Hegelian system, as beautiful as it is, is ultimately a system of externality. It is profound, it gets so many things right, but ultimately your individuality does not exist in the Hegelian system. Insofar as you want to try to find yourself as an individual in Hegel, you will eventually either find yourself in the category of evil from a Hegelian standpoint, or you will necessarily begin to simply recognize that your spirit, your geist, finds itself in its recognition of the way in which the same spirit that structures you has structured the objective institutional forms and social and historical patterns that have shaped you and that you see yourself and your fellow human beings. And ultimately, you reconcile yourself with this as a finite part of this beautiful organic unfolding of the divine spirit and then when you die that's your role and you're done so for hegel ultimately there is no transcendence this is the kierkegaardian critique and what eternity means for kierkegaard is what creates what he calls the individual i as a child i share this with you somewhat uh nervously but I, it's an important psychological fact i realized i had it in common with Jacobi. When I read Paul Frank's book on German idealism, All or Nothing, Paul Frank's is my mentor at Yale, a great scholar of German idealism as well as uh, Jewish philosophy and its connection to German idealism. 
But I, I was the sort of person who, from my earliest memories as a kid, I was afraid both of dying, which, you know, did not seem like a great thing. But also I was afraid of living forever because I was raised in a religious household. And so I was raised with the idea, I thought, of eternity. It wasn't eternity. It was really infinity. Um, infinity is unendingness, but eternity is something different. It's a different quality. It's not just time continued. Okay. But Hegel thinks that what the individual is comes to fullness finally in a form of finitude. And any infinitude or any eternality of the human is only really exists insofar as the human is a species and part of the overall system of the unfolding spirit, absolute spirit. And this view is so seductive and beautiful. I mean, I love it. I still study Hegel. I'm going to teach Hegel throughout my life. Um, I respect Hegel enormously, just like Kierkegaard does. But I can understand Hegel. Kierkegaard understood Hegel very well. Hegelians tend to have a very difficult time understanding Christ Christianity in Kierkegaard's sense. Because for Hegelians, Christianity simply becomes a moment of the system. And this radical idea that the God behind Christianity is a God who actually would sacrifice, in a sense, the whole system to save one individual in the system, it just seems evil. It seems absurd. And I'm not making any simplistic claim here, but it's therefore not an accident that the Hegelian system through Feuerbach gives rise to Marx. And Marx is not a system that respects individuality. Marx has ethical values which sound very nice for individuals, and I, I think are. I sympathize with many of the ethical values of Marxism. But the Marxist system is Hegelian and rationalistic to its core. And rationalistic systems destroy the human individual. They destroy it. And so the Enlightenment, through its cult of reason, which is not actually reasonable, elevates essentially the idea of conscious understanding and control and articulacy. Whoever can talk the best, articulate themselves the best, they are the wisest, they are the smartest, and they are the deepest. And that's obviously false. It's obviously false. The Tao Te Ching, the great text of Chinese philosophy, authored by Lao Tzu, the Tao Te Ching says, the speaking do not know, and the knowing do not, the knowing do not speak, and the speaking do not know. Now, this is just a nice paradox, you could say, but it's more than that. The Tao's fundamental vision of what it is to be good is water. One of the most famous chapters of the Tao is chapter 8, which in the translation by um, um, Scott Wilson goes like this. The greatest good is like water. Water's virtue is that it benefits all creatures but contends with none. This idea of non-contention or non-action, wei wu wei, is central in the Tao to act without acting. So water's um, virtue is that it benefits all creatures, but it contends with none. Thus, it, resi it resides, it dwells in places most people hate, in low places. Water sinks down into low places. And in this way, it resembles the way. The way dwells in low places that the noble, high-minded people wouldn't maybe think to see. That's what the good is like. It's like a low pool of water. And then this incredible chapter gives a series of very specific definitions of what is the good in this specific instance. So it says, for land, the place itself is considered good. For the mind, depth is considered good. Depth. And so the idea that the depth of the mind is the mind's unique virtue is a very profound idea. And what you see is that systems and societies that privilege what they call rationality, like our society, and I'm not saying that this is what true science is, but when you privilege a form of rationality that is only externally expressed power, control, and articulacy, what we call science, and particularly what we call technology, which is sort of science applied as living power, then you recognize this does not produce depth. You know, I'm a great admirer of many of the technological innovators of our time and of the past. Um, but in general, you can't accuse these people of being profound human beings. I mean, they're incredibly skilled human beings, beings to whom we all owe some sort of perhaps debt, uh, maybe of resentment, of gratitude, maybe of a mix. But right, I respect their enormous achievements, right? It's, it's a big deal to be able to innovate, say, in rocket development the way Elon Musk did to allow reusable rockets. I think it's silly when people who don't like Elon Musk mock that. I mean, that's an incredible business achievement for which he will rightly go down in history, whatever you think of him as a person. 
And it's not an insult to say, okay, we have these impressive, you know, if you like them, kind of philosopher kings as they style themselves in Silicon Valley. If you don't like them, you see them as very dangerous um, ideological people with a lot of technical and social power. But the point is, these people and the people who speak on behalf of science, whatever their virtues or graces are, as you may see them, I don't think depth is generally one of them. And that's not an insult to them. But I'm pointing out that the system of reason, the system of reason does not produce existential depth. And I'm not saying, for example, Hegel's shallow. Any great deep thinker has depth. Hegel's a very deep system. Schelling is a deep system. But the issue is it's not about depth in general. It's about the individual. Can an individual, by studying a thinker, come to a deeper appreciation of their own value, their own dignity, their own unique calling and what that means? And can they, through that calling, come into a deeper relationship with eterni eternity itself? Because Kierkegaard thinks that the depth of the individual comes from recognizing that the human being is not just in time. The human being confronts eternity like a great mystery. In other words, it confronts the idea that we are partially made up of something that radically transcends our awareness of it. Radically. There's something that is internally essential to who we are that utterly baffles our categories of comprehension, utterly baffles our categories of description. And yet it is, as Augustine said, more internal to me than I am to myself. Something Augustine famously said, in his prayer to God in the confessions, that God, you are more internal to me, more deeply inside of me than I am in myself. This is an incredible paradox of, you could say, the Christian philosophical tradition. But the recognition is that there's something divine in the human being, and divinity in this radical way is not external, visible, systematic rationality. What divinity means in this sense is an internal concealed depth and value, something that connects you to not only all of time before and after you, but it connects you to an order of reality that is paradoxically higher than time or beyond time. And Kierkegaard believed that the age he lived in, this age of reflection that leads to disintegration, of conformity that leads to the destruction of individuals in the name of individuals, of a form of a cult of science that leads to the destruction of genuine scientific rigor in the name of a misconstrued ideal of rationality as male power. Kierkegaard saw in all of this the great threat to the reality that everything that we are as a human being must eventually pass through the single individual. So this idea that seems so radical is that all of history, in a sense, would be waiting for you would be waiting for you to take responsibility for yourself and confront the great adventure and mystery of your own existence and to ask, what really does it mean to be human? And to recognize in asking that question that you recognize this is a process, that my human being is in becoming. Hegel famously says, das Sein ist im Werden, in the phenomenology of spirit, that the being or existence is in the process of becoming. A beautiful doctrine. But it's in becoming in not just the individual as a part of the system, but the individual that only we can bring through our gifts into reality. And in a way, Kierkegaard is very much part of the German idealist system, as I'm going to explain in the next course, um, the audio course. I'll talk in more detail about how Kierkegaard is a German idealist and how he represents, in a sense, the alternate trajectory of German idealism as it goes towards existentialism in the 20th century. But this idea of the single individual is therefore the idea that essentially inside of you, there's something so precious, so unique, that a being that transcended the entirety of the order of space and time would enter into that order of space and time, would conceal in a complete paradox and mystery all of its grandeur and glory and greatness, and would take on the form of a slave, would take on the form of a servant, would take on the form of an incredibly ill person who was sick, who people would look at and be repulsed by, and they would look away from. And Kierkegaard's idea is the true nature of God, if you believe in the true God, is a God who is revealed through the hidden power 
of love and respect for ourselves and the neighbor, which Kierkegaard wrote better about than I think almost anyone, maybe in the past 200 years, his work on loving your neighbor. This is the most basic Jewish teaching. And according to Judaism, all of the law in Deuteronomy, it says, is summed up in two commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. This is the great commandment, and then the second is like unto it. People who don't know the Old Testament well think Jesus invented this. He's just quoting the Torah. So this idea of, well, what does it mean to love your neighbor as yourself raises the question about what is it that you're loving when you truly love yourself? And Kierkegaard thinks to truly love yourself, you have to recognize that yourself is a project. And you can see that this is part of the deep influence of Kierkegaard on my work. And you can see, I think, if you've taken my Heidegger course, or if you take the audio course on Kierkegaard, it's a great preparation for Heidegger. Or if you've heard the Heidegger course, you can listen to that, and then you can appreciate Kierkegaard even more, because you can see Kierkegaard's influence on Heidegger and how they're different. But this stress on the individual is powerful. Heidegger does not give a damn about the individual. Heidegger was a Nazi, a happily unrepentant Nazi who believed in Deutschtum, Germanness. He believed in the radical chosenness of the German people and their superiority. He believed the Jews were the great threat to Deutschtum and to even international humanity because the Jews were this parasite. He used all of these vile anti-Semitic tropes. Heidegger is not a defender of individuality. Heidegger is, in that sense, a typical betrayer of the individual in the name of the individual. And we somehow love these thinkers that give us the mystery of uniqueness while they lead us right into the most old-fashioned forms of right-wing authoritarianism, fascism, conformism, and hatred of others who are different than us. Kierkegaard offers something much more difficult. And th this is his mission in life. Kierkegaard and his Klimakus pseudonym, Johannes Klimakus, who again, I'll discuss the Johannes Klimakus pseudonym in the audio course. I discussed this. Johannes Klimakus says in this wonderful anecdote, he's sitting in a cafe in Denmark, the character, and he says, I decided that my mission in life was to make Christianity more difficult. He wanted to make it difficult for people because people thought that they were Christian by being born into Christendom. So in the anecdote I mentioned and didn't finish, a Danish man who's therefore a Christian by virtue of having been baptized as a child before he even had any memory of it, he, he has doubts about whether he's a Christian. And his wife pulls out the map of Denmark and she says, here, dear, is this not Denmark? Yes, it is. Is Denmark not a Christian nation? Yes, it is. Were you not born in Denmark? Yes, I was. Then of course you're a Christian, right? And so Christian for Kierkegaard, you can think of as the word human. Because we think, well, I'm human, right? In the sense that I'm born into humanity, right? You could look at a map and you could say, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm on earth. You can look at your parents and say, they're human beings. They're human animals. You can look at all the people who recognize you as a human being and say, well, they're human and I live amongst humans. So therefore I'm human. And of course, you're human in the sense that potentially you could become what your humanity is whispers to you. But you can only become that if you listen to the depths of what is true and wise and good. And the depths require submission to the pattern of things, knowledge of the pattern of things, knowledge of what Kierkegaard calls the dialectic of existence. Kierkegaard thinks a true human understanding won't leave anything out. Right? The problem with Hegel's system is not that it's complete. It's that in a radical sense, it isn't complete because of its sense of totality. It eliminates the one thing needful. And therefore, one of Kierkegaard's amusing images, and again, the Johannes Klimakus pseudonym, in the concluding unscientific postscript, he says, imagine a person who builds the most magnificent house, this great, towering, beautiful edifice. And then, as soon as it's finished, they live right next door in a little hovel. A crappy little house. They spend all this time building the system and then they live their existence in this hovel because the system building wasn't about the building of their own selfhood. And so the question is, how can we come to a harmonious relationship between the external and the internal, between our need to conform, to be safe, to realize our full humanity, 
and our need to be unique. And Kierkegaard thinks there's no external way of describing this. It's dialectical. It is a process of existential conversational movement and becoming in your own life through the aesthetic phase into the ethical phase and from the ethical phase, confronting that you are truly enormously valuable. Kierkegaard would want me to insist as someone presenting his thought that he would say, the entirety of existence were completely fine and well would be set aside, would be left in its good condition by the one who made it, if you believed in such a being, just to help you become human. Now you could say, I don't believe in that God. Again, that's fine if you don't. Most Christians don't believe in that God either, Kierkegaard would say. Christendom has therefore turned into what we call the modern secular world. Right? The modern secular world, as I argue at length in Becoming Human Origins, is not secular in the sense of not religious. It's simply a form of Christianity that's decided it can opt out of some parts of Christianity and accept others and give no rational account of why it's doing it. And that's the same thing Christendom did. Christendom just treated Christianity as if it was somehow a given reality and that it could change it when it wanted to and obey it when it wanted to and basically be in charge of it. And that's basically what secular humanity is in this specific sense. It's a historically conditioned form of religiosity that says humans can decide what to do with their lives, which is true in one sense, but it's not true that we decide in a vacuum. And it's not true that we can ignore the historical forces that condition us if we wish to truly become ourselves. And so the goal of Kierkegaard's entire system is to help you realize that you are, as the single individual, an enormous eternal source and seat of value. And there's a great quote from C.S. Lewis, a very brilliant um, scholar of uh, English literature and thought, particularly medieval and Renaissance literature, first at Oxford, then at Cambridge. He became famous through the 20th century for his works he wrote about Christianity because he was a very devout um, atheist philosopher. And then he became uh, a Christian of a very strange kind of, I would say, neo-medieval progressive um, form of Christianity, kind of progressive medievalism, if you will. It's something I'm going to talk about when I write about Lewis. But Lewis is not conservative or liberal. He's very liberal in many ways. He's a very traditional English, Irish man in other ways, just of his time. But his religious doctrine is actually very radical. And he says at the end of one of his sermons, I think given during World War II, he says that if you really saw what you were as a human being, if you saw another person for what their potential was, you would recognize they were becoming something so awful if they were becoming evil that you would actually see like a, a horrific image of a demon from hell or you would see something so glorious if the person is on their way to becoming truly human that you would be tempted to bow down and worship them as a god. And if you don't know that feeling of bowing down to worship something greater than yourself, that's part of what Kierkegaard means. He thinks Christendom has eviscerated this feeling of piety before something great, before something noble. And we need this feeling. We need the feeling of nobility. If you've never read the beautiful vision of Isis and Asclepius's um, The Golden Ass, or, then read that. It's, it's the last chapter of the book. It's astounding work. Of, it's one of the most important records of ancient religious practice and piety, and certainly the most important Latin testament to the mystery religions. Um, and the cult of the female goddess, the goddess Isis. Um, but that is a very traditional Roman value, pious Aeneas, we say, right, from the Aeneid, pious. Piety has to do with responding to the greatness and grandeur of what gives rise to yourself and your world, that you respond to with gratitude and humility. And we are ennobled by a sense of our greatness, but we come to know our greatness through recognizing we're somehow linked to something greater than ourselves, a dignity that we don't scarcely recognize as part of our own possibility, but that it is part of our possibility. And this is the same message in a different way Emerson had when he said the true human would have the strength to reconstitute the entire world from themselves. Very hard teaching. I think that's in self-reliance, Emerson's famous essay. But Emerson is connected to the same underlying insight that Kierkegaard is. That if you truly became the single individual that you are, you would have the strength not just to carry the human species in yourself like a megalomaniac wanting to replace it. That's not what he means. 
But you would have that power of will in the face of difficulty and trial and even tragedy. You would have the power of will to say that which I am, that which I have been given to discover is greater than my circumstances, is greater than my historical moment and condition. It requires me to acknowledge it, to in a sense submit to that, to appreciate who we are, but it's not defined by it. You're not defined by your historical location or your group identities. They do shape you radically and in ways that may require radical responses to, which is a part of what social justice movements are often about, rightly. But they don't define you because they can't reach your depths. They can't reach your depths. And it's the depths of you in your freedom, the depths of you as a person that is worthy of value that you can scarcely comprehend, that is worthy of being treated as a person, whatever you know we may have done contingently or however messed up or difficult we may feel our lives to be. Kierkegaard thinks that the more you come to know who you truly are, you recognize a greatness and a glory and a possibility of love and hope and forgiveness if you feel you need it, um, that can heal us. So becoming human is ultimately the project for Kierkegaard of becoming the single individual that you and you alone are and can be. And that is an incredible discovery. And if you've enjoyed this journey towards that discovery and you want to continue it, then I would ask you to check out the audio course that is released today. You can use the course um, Becoming Human with Kierkegaard. Um, you can just put Becoming Human with SK because his name is hard and tricky to spell. So Becoming Human with SK. And you'll get 10% off of that course if you want it. But I'd also encourage you to just share this if you enjoy it. Please do subscribe to the channel and like it. It's been my great privilege as a philosopher to share my work on Kierkegaard with you and uh, to know that it's reached some fellow Kierkegaard scholars. If you're all interested, I'm, I'm hoping to maybe do an interview series now and again with other Kierkegaard scholars so we can talk about Kierkegaard if you want to learn more about him. And then I'd be glad to bring uh, other Kierkegaard scholars to you on this in my podcast. So I hope that you find your own journey ennobled and enriched by the study of Søren Kierkegaard. And I hope that you experience in your understanding of Søren Kierkegaard in your own life, the greatness and dignity and value that you have. And that if you want to call that religion, that's what Kierkegaard does mean by religion, a connection to what is eternal in you, to what transcends everything that time has done for good or ill to you. Something transcends that. That's Kierkegaard's deepest conviction. And he believes that conviction is what brings into existence the individual is the conviction that we're not just time-bound creatures of history. We're not less than that. But in the mystery of the human, eternity somehow has entered into time. And that dialectic of eternity and time will go on to define the 19th century, the 20th century, and our own day. Because where eternity is eliminated, eventually the individual is exterminated. Where eternity is eliminated, eventually the individual is exterminated. And the history of the 20th century is absolute proof of that. Whatever your politics, whatever your philosophy, it's not about that. Just look at the reality. Do we live in a world of true individualism? No. The possible critique of individualism is as shallow as it could possibly be. This is not individualism. It's consumer capitalism. It's human nature the Catholics would just call sin if they knew their own theology well, expressed in a normal way under the forces of capitalism. In order to transcend that, we have to recognize that's something we all have in common. We all have a tendency to not be what we want to be and to be less than we should be. But the dialectical movement that can let us transcend that is to recognize that and not be defined by it, but to be defined by something that we have to discover inside of ourselves that no one has seen or heard that is still a mystery and a rumor. And I hope that you find that mystery and that rumor speaking in yourself and that you'll give it the dignity of listening carefully to it and that it might lead you to the light and to the truth and to the true way of becoming human and to join me on that project. Thank you for doing so this far. I hope you continue to share the work, like the work, and I wish blessings upon you and your life. I'm Samuel Longar. I'm the founder and creator of the Becoming Human Project. 
This is episode eight and the conclusion of my public series on Kierkegaard, the poet of existence. Please check out right now, if you will, and are interested the audio series that continues this work and goes into more depth. Thank you. <laughs>